Okay, shall we start? All questions, you can uh, ask the question on Slido and I will forward them to Katarina. So hello everyone. Hello uh, all of you who has just joined us. So a few words about Katarina. Uh, she spent uh, more than 12 years leading projects in high-risk countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. She has international development background and witnesses epidemics, poverty, wars, conflicts, and natural disasters. Today, she works for as a consultant senior project manager within the tech industries in Sweden. Welcome, Katerina Korenkova. Thank you, thank you very much. So You're I will welcome. go ahead and yeah, I, will... I just stop sharing. Okay. Now. Share my screen. But first, I think, well, I can see more, some of you. Uh, hello. It's really great that you are here and that you are supporting this course. So thank you for that. Um, and here I will share. Present. Yes. Here. Okay, can you see my screen? Gosh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Right. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, you have already introduced me. So there is there anything else that I should say about me? But I am actually a volunteer for PMI Sweden chapter. I'm a very passionate volunteer, quite engaged for different initiatives. I am now also at the, a board member serving my third year. So it's a great way also uh, to just give back to the project management community. You have already mentioned I'm a senior project. I'm also an agile leader. And yes, I work now currently within the tech and IT industry, and I am a consultant at a company, Swedish company, consultancy company called Progress Lead. And you have already really mentioned my background. It's international development, it's humanitarian management. And yes, I have lived in the, and worked in developing countries in Africa and Middle East. If any of you are wondering, I lived in Malawi, I lived in Palestine for several years, many years together. And then of course I visited many other countries. Uh, also, I am from Slovakia, but I am living now in Sweden for six years and I've got two very small boys, which I hope are not going to come home anytime soon. They are only two years and four years old. And uh, yeah, it might be difficult to hold this presentation if they are around, but Yes, you already mentioned, I've got that firsthand uh, experience with the poverty, the pandemics, but also the worst the conflicts, and to some uh, extent also with disasters such as cyclones and droughts that were caused by the climate change. And then, of course, I did work also on the projects that were in high-risk countries, and I was involved uh, in some extent in a humanitarian response in an Indonesia where there was a um, quite big um, tsunami and earthquake disaster. So that's background about me. In this session, uh, I will really talk, um, or I will really start talking about a sustainable versus unsustainable projects. What are the differences? And I came with a few real cases from, from three industries that we can go through. Also, I would like to touch and go with you through a root causes. Why is it that we do this, that we continue doing these unsustainable projects? And then, what are the benefits? What is the value of doing sustainable projects? And then how can we really ensure that the projects that we are doing are sustainable? 
So I move forward comparing sustainable and unsustainable projects. And here, here are some key, we can say attributes of these two different projects, sustainable. Of course, how do we define them? How do we know? Yes, this was a sustainable project once it's delivered. How do uh, the customers, the stakeholders really can say, yes, this was a sustainable project. They appreciate and value it. Because those projects actually consider a long-term impact. And they have a very strong sustainable vision. They do not think just about delivering some project benefits now. They look far away. They look not just the next 10 years, they might even look on a couple of next generations. And of course, that vision, sustainable vision that is a driver for those projects. And of course, that vision is driven by the company. Sustainable projects balance the interests of different stakeholders. And the aim is here really to minimize or really eliminate any negative impacts. But let's be honest here. Can we really have 100% sustainable projects? I think that's a huge challenge. And I would say it's really almost impossible. I think it's more about the balance, finding the right balance here. And we need to accept that sometimes we do need to make trade-offs. I think when it comes to sustainable projects, uh, there is quite an inequality in how they are distributed all over the world. So maybe it's quite possible to do sustainable project in a developed countries where we have all the resources and the knowledge and the latest technology. But then if we look in the developing countries, maybe there are not all resources, there are more other priorities and the sustainability just cannot be the priority number one. And then of course, sustainable projects they balance those social, environmental, and all the economic aspects because they consider also the economy at large, the future of the economy. And now going to the unsustainable projects. I think we can definitely point and show the finger on them. Yes, this is just a project that failed people. This is a project that have failed our planet. How? Because we can see they deplete natural resources and they do harm our ecosystems and the communities. They generally generate the pollution and the waste. And they, of course, they disregard long-term impact. Yes, it's about the profit, it's about now. Here, and here's a little bit of warning because I will show some real cases with the pictures and maybe one or few might be upsetting. But let's look at three industries, the construction industry projects. Now, I think we all know that this, is, uh, this industry and these projects are the major contributors to the environmental degradation and climate change. Just if we think about the raw material mining for the salmon, for example, it involves deforestation, but also for the sand, all the raw materials. It involves deforestation, land degradation, water contamination, and of course, human rights violations. I have lived in Africa and I have seen in Malawi in country, and I have seen that happening where there is a children use as a labor in mining companies. It's happening, it's still happening today. And the facts here that the building sectors and making the buildings accounts for 40% of a global energy consumption. 25% of all our global water consumption 
and 33% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this comes from an unsustainable magazine, as in fact. But now, uh, let's be a little bit positive here, because there is also a trend for sustainable projects. More and more companies want to create, want to build, want to do sustainable, uh, sustainable um, architecture, sustainable buildings. And I guess we have to do it. Urbanization is a trend. We have to consider how we are living and that we live well. Here is an example of a project. It's called the Edge in Amsterdam, and it's one of the world's greenest and smartest buildings. Just a credit here for the picture that comes from the Ronald Tilleman. But this building in Amsterdam is actually a net zero energy consumption. Uses solar panels, natural lighting, it even collects rainwater for irrigation. And of course, it has a lot of different smart solutions that are just helping the people who are using this building to just navigate, to use it efficiently. And now, here comes an upsetting, build, uh, upsetting image. I think all of you, or most of you know this picture, this image. And of course, this is from Turkey. And this is the reason why we are here. This is the reason why also I am here today speaking. Just a credit here for the picture. This was a picture made by Adam Altan, a Turkish photographer. It comes from Getty Images. And as you can see, um, here we are talking really about the projects from the construction industry that failed to protect lives. Yes, the cause here is the earthquakes. And we it's really hard to predict earthquakes. They do happen, they are natural disasters. They have their purpose. However, the role or the purpose of the construction projects here is to protect lives, is to minimize the impact of the disasters, which are in the areas which are prone to earthquakes. However, as we can see, and the reasons are complex, but it has happened. The project constructions projects have failed people. And this is just one example. This is happening all over the world. Now moving to an energy industry projects. Now all these two are connected buildings, and energy industry. And I think energy right now is very relevant for us, right? Because we do have a crisis, uh, not crisis, we have a war in Ukraine. And this has really impacted um, us globally. The energy prices are going up. But when we look at the energy industry projects, they are actually responsible for the most of the global greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. And they do cause really negative impact on health. Still, there is a continued reliance on the coil as a source of electricity generation. And while there is a trend to go away from the coil, that might not be case in the developing countries who just do not have a resources maybe to start building some renewable plants. Also here, uh, a fact that the energy sector accounts for nearly 90% of a global CO2 emissions in 2019. And here is an interesting part that the emission increased in 2021 as a result of the economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. This is something that comes from International Energy Agency. What does it mean? We had a COVID and I think we were, oh, this is a nice break for the planet in some way, not good for people, maybe good for a planet in some way. But as we can see, uh, 
the emissions has increased after a bit epidemic. They have even increased. It means that we have not learned the lessons. And I guess that's quite natural for us as humans. It's sometimes quite hard for us to change, to learn and change. Some pictures. Now let's be positive. There are great trends as well in energy sector and energy sector projects. Here is a project called Copenhill or Amayerbakke. This is the world's cleanest waste to energy plant um, in Amsterdam, or sorry, is it in Amsterdam, in Denmark. And uh, also here a credit uh, from Halton and Crow. And yes, it's in Denmark, in Copenhagen, very close to where I am located, actually. I am based in Malmo in Sweden. So very close. I have never been there, but I really want to go and see this place. This plant, waste to energy plant, it's quite unique in the world. It actually produces a clean energy and it converts 440,000 tons of waste into clean energy every year. This means that it provides electricity and district heating for 150,000 homes, just this building. Uh, and then of course, they have also considered a social aspects of sustainability. This is like a mountain. If you have been in Nordic regions, especially in the, uh, Denmark or Sweden, it's very flat. And look here, there is a mountain in the middle of the Copenhagen. Isn't it amazing? For me, yes. So it really also considers other people's needs, the stakeholders of these projects. What do they want? How they will trust this building? And now we go a little bit negative here. And this is uh, very interesting because we, we talked about the energy now, but uh, we have talked that the coil is still prevalent, but also oil and gas drilling expansion projects are now booming and they are going to Arctics. Also very interesting here, the picture that you can see here, the credit goes to uh, Thomas Nielsen for Barents Observer. But a uh, very interesting thing here is that this is exploration and expansion drilling that is happening in Norway. And because of this crisis, Norway have really extended this drilling we have here Sweden, which is trying to be sustainable as much as possible, but the neighboring country is going widely ahead and seeing quite big profit. Perhaps it's a solution to a rising energy crisis, but definitely this is not a good solution for a climate change. Because we know that the gas drilling expansion is going to affect a very a pristine and very special um, um, environment of the Arctics. But okay, let's go now to a tech and IT industry projects. And you might ask, is tech really failing us as a people? Uh, it is. It is contributing somehow to uh, climate change. It is very much so. And it is also causing or has a big ethical and social risk. We are now already living in an, in an AI age, but we can ask, we, we have here JetGTP, we have here a Bitcoin, uh, but maybe those environmental impacts are not as visible as from other projects, but there are big impacts. In fact, actually the world generates 57.4 million metric tons of e-waste 
in 2021. E-waste actually means all those things that we, uh, digital things that we don't stop using, our phones, uh, our, our um, yeah, all the technology, our cables and so on. But only 17% of it is recycled. The rest of the e-waste ends up in the landfills of or are exported to developing countries by UN. And that's true. And I have witnessed this. I have lived in Malawi for eight years and all that people could work with were decommissioned computers and technology. It's horrible. It's, it's uh, the first world countries basically dumping all the e-waste to developing countries and even making profit out of it. That's not a solution. And here are some examples, some positive ones. A real case, this one comes from Sweden. Uh, when we th think about the tech here, a new technology, Sweden is actually a very innovative country and it's creating, producing um, green batteries. Uh, it's produced by a Northvolt Gigafactory that actually started very recently production and it's starting already supply uh, batteries or it's powering uh, the electric, um, electric cars in Sweden, all the brands, the Swedish brands here in Sweden. And that's a huge progress. And here is something very interesting. Well, here we have a Norway that is going forward and is starting to drill in Arctis and going for the gas and oil. But here in Sweden, this company has a mission and has a vision that they want to make an oil and a, they want to make an oil a history. So it's very interesting. These are just two neighboring countries with a very different approach here. Negative here. AI, IT projects. If you hear facial recognition and use of AI in Iran to survey and punish unveiled women. Very recent, and it's happening. This is happening as we speak. And uh, Iran is not the only country where AI is used for an unethical purposes. This is something that we need to change. It's, it's a AI and IT projects. It's, it's quite hard. Maybe they seem very complex and they change really fast. It's really difficult to even learn them because they are changing so fast. Really hard to keep up with them. And we do need to start asking the right questions because AI has also an incredible power to move our world, our society ahead and help us with the big challenges, health challenges, with people, with environmental problems. AI is a great solution. However, it's based on the data, it's based on algorithms that are very biased. And we do need to ask the right questions, we do need to set some policies. And yes, we can either say, hello, welcome, progress, come here. Or we can be a little bit, start being aware and ask the question, how this AI, how it can be used in different projects. So these were the three um, different industries and the projects. And example of a sustainable and unsustainable projects. But it is quite, quite clear that one is bad and another is good. But we still keep doing those unsustainable projects. Why? Why we keep doing them? Root causes. And those will be really obvious ones, I think. But of course, these projects are driven by a short term goals profit. And yes, deadlines. Sometimes there is just a project that has a deadline. Maybe there is a pressure and we just need to do and deliver this project. Also crisis and of course the political agendas. 
This project or the root cause is that we are simply not caring, not considering all those different impacts on the environment, on people and a large economy. And then another second root cause, lack of awareness and education among the project stakeholders. Again, are people aware that these projects or the benefits that we are delivering from the projects, was it sustainable? Uh, is the product sustainable? Is it really, is the, is the chain sustainable? We also lack of knowledge and skill of us as an project professionals. Do we really know everything about, perhaps, yes, of course, not everything, but do we know the basic things about sustainability? Do we know how we can make projects so they don't fail people, don't fail the planet? I think not. I don't have those skills and the knowledge. Then, of course, the lack of regulations and resources like funding. The regulations are perhaps there, but we don't respect them. Or maybe they're just not forced. And the resources coming back again, there might be a lot of resources and even a policies and a drive in the developed countries to be now sustainable and to have a sustainable future. But if you are in developing countries, where is the funding? There are different priorities. There are different challenges. It's hard. It's hard to do uh, sustainable projects. And then I think this one is also very important. The third root cause, a lack of collaboration and communication among the different actors. There are some conflicts of interest and power imbalances. I have read an article from automotive industry. So there is a trend towards electrification. We want to be driving electric cars. And today we have the technology to make it happen and it should be going fast. But look, we are still driving cars uh, that use not renewable energy. Why is it so? And that's because those companies, they are not collaborating. Perhaps uh, it is because of the com competitive advantage. They do not want to collaborate because they want to be the best company th that is making the most profit with the electric cars. So now let's do projects that don't fail people. But why? Why we should do it? Here are the benefits or the value that we can have from a sustainable projects. And I imagine this as a, as a house, if we think about it. The foundations here of this house of us making sustainable projects is actually care, a genuine care and the commitment that we want to do projects that positive, that have a positive environmental, social and economic impact. Or simply, we will do a projects that will do no harm. And of, of course, the other things which are building this house and are making these projects, sustainable projects, the value really that we can get is the new opportunities because, of course, sustainable projects, they, people need innovation and collaboration. And that might mean new markets, new products or services, partnership. So at the end of the day, sustainable project will mean increased profit. Also, profit by improving efficiency reducing waste, optimizing resources. And of course, we will have the happy stakeholders that are not complaining. They are not uh, going against the project because it's unsustainable and making their lives miserable. They will support it. They will buy the products and the benefits of the projects. And then here's something that I think is more of a roof here or the windows of this house is 
they increase organizational value. So the companies that are doing the sustainable projects, they will have better reputation, a brand image, and of course, the competitive advantage. And of course, that means attracting and retaining customers, investors, and so on. It's a cycle, increase profit. Perhaps it will take a bit longer. Perhaps it will be not now, but it will be a sustainable development. It will be a sustainable value. Now, let's do a project that don't fail people, but how? How can we do it? Us as a project professionals? And I think there are three aspects to it. And the one, is a sustainable governance. It actually all starts with a sustainable vision and a strategy at a company level, really. That company will clearly um, define their vision, define their vision and the strategy. And they don't just greenwash. They don't just sustainable goals wash they actually commit and they are ready to make initiatives and they are ready to execute. Then here, sustainable processes. We need those sustainable processes, policies, the roadmaps that look quite ahead, but they are ready to adapt. It needs a portfolio of governments. Now we have a, our PMOs, the sustainability needs to be there, the priority, or at least to have a high priority. And then, of course, here, a sustainable project management and a sustainable value delivery. And I think of here, the top triangle here on the top, this is really a driver of the sustainable projects. Here, the middle part, the PMO, they are the enablers of sustainable projects. And here, of course, here, we are here, we execute, we make the ideas the reality. We make those sustainable projects. The second aspect, which is, I think here, which we need, is actually a sustainable project life cycle. And here is kind of a typical life cycle it can be quite different, but of course we have our initiation, planning, implementation, controlling, closing. We all know it. But right in the initiation, we actually conduct an ESG assessment. An ESG here means an environmental sustainable governments assessment. We look, how is this initiative going to impact all the stakeholders. And then in the planning, of course, we develop an ESG strategy and action plan. It's a part of our project plans, the ESG, the sustainability. Then implementing, but also putting sustainability in any design and in any development. So the now implementation of ESG action plan, but also building in sustainability, in quality, in engineering, in building, in our processes. And then controlling here. And this means not just communicating with stakeholders. Oh, yes. Now we are delivering this and it's going quite well or it's not going so well, but we are going to be sustainable. No, also listening to them, asking them for the response. Are you already impacted somehow? Maybe something has changed. We need to adapt to change. And I think we need to dare here to say pivot. Pivot the project, is it making a bad impact. So we need to stop the project. And I think that's quite a duty and responsibility of us and the project professionals to come in and say, look, this project is just not right project to do for now, for the future. Let's stop it. 
or let's change it. And of course, closing, sorry, closing. Now, evaluating those outcomes. Have we been really sustainable or no? Have we been sustainable? Uh, but I think it also includes recycling, whatever we have produced. How can we become more circular? And of course, sharing and acting on the learnings. And I think we are quite used to this uh, project life cycle, and this is how we define the project. It has a clear start, a clean, uh, clean end, and that's it. But I think, in my opinion, this is very unsustainable. I think we need to start or rethink the project life cycle and look at it as a loop. Perhaps this project means something else. Maybe it will lead to another project or another project. Uh, it just becomes better and better we recycle. So I think it's also rethinking how we are doing projects at the moment. And now the last one slide also for me uh, here. And I think this is a big one for us that we are the change makers and the influencers here. If we really do want to have a sustainable projects now and in the future for the generations to come, we, all of us, we need to become the change makers. And we already are, right? That's what we say. We are the change makers. But we need to influence. We need to contribute to those industry and professional standards. Are they really talking enough? Is there a sustainability standards in the normal project management? Maybe we should review the PM book. Are we talking enough? Is it a priority there? And then let's put sustainability on agenda and also walk the talk. So we don't just greenwash, we don't just talk about the sustainability and how to do sustainable projects, we actually really walk the talk. And I think this conference is one of the great examples where we are talking the walk. Then let's have a courage to challenge the ways of doing projects. And let's have the courage to challenge those initiatives that do uh, the environmental, social and economic harm. Pivot, let's pivot then, let's change them. Let's have the courage to say, let's go, let's go to, and I think that was said in the previous session that we need to know the business and we also need to be involved in the business decision. This is the trend. So also here, if we want to do a projects that don't fail people, we need to take on that role and influence those business decisions. And then here, making sustainability our power skill. We need to learn about it. We, it needs to be, become part of it, part of us, a, a normal, and be a sustainability a keeper, I'm missing a word here, a sustainable keeper, maybe in our organizations. We are the one uh, coming in front. Let's do projects that are sustainable. Let's stop doing those projects that are just harming others. And then of course, we need to create collaborations because together we can, as we can see from this conference. So, now I believe I am out of my time. So I want to really thank you of being part of this conference, donating for the children through UNICEF. Uh, really thankful to all the people, the team that made this happen. It's really a lot of hours that you have contributed. And I think we all really appreciate, I appreciate. So it's a huge thank you to me, to entire team, uh, PMI Ukraine, uh, to all chapters. And I think we need to do it much more often. So this is from me, the end. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have a quick question. 
on yes. recycling. Um, I remember a long time ago, we recycle carpets when we are refurbishing the offices. Uh, and do you have any, any examples of nice uh, recycling in your project from your from your project management life to share with us? Or maybe other other um, practices you want to share? It doesn't yes, need to be recycling. I, yeah, a circular economy. Uh, this is actually something that is on the top agenda in Sweden, the circular economy. There, so there is a lot to learn from Sweden. I think. Uh, but very recent example, because I now work in an IT industry, and of course, we use a lot of devices in our offices, right? A lot of mobile phones. I think all of you, uh, let's, uh, let's think, how many mobile phones do you have at home? I have at least one spare computer, and at least we have maybe five uh, devices and other that are not working or, yeah. We don't need them anymore, right? Because we can have the latest versions. So, for example, my company has partnered, collaborated with an NGO, uh, with a charity uh, that is uh, helping to raise funds for a missing people by uh, um, by um, uh, refurbishing uh, devices. So this can be one great way of collaboration for the companies. Let's use all those devices and we can just recycle. We can give them for free and th they can be used for the benefit of the other people. So that's an example that just pops in my mind. Thank you very much. You're reminding me as well. That's what we did for Ukrainian um, children here in Poland because there are a lot of uh, of them so we did uh, from the company we got the computers uh, we asked someone to to get them ready and we uh, we forward them to kids mm -hmm. so they could uh, do online lessons mm -hmm. just one more thing i want to mention because i think there's things that we are maybe not aware uh, and i have mentioned before for example having a devices and then that's an e-waste and then we think we are doing good so we donate them right and they go to a developing countries, but then that's not the solution. And it also very much happens, it's a huge problem that is killing industries, for example, in Africa, where we are dumping our unused clothes to Africa, right? Or to other countries, killing uh, the industry, the manufacturing industries of the fabrics, because people just can buy a very affordable, but secondhand clothes. It's a big business, it's a big project, but it has actually a negative impact. So I think we need to step up in our awareness of what are really the sustainable projects or circularity. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes we think we are doing good things, but the effect might be completely different. Mm. You can still use... Uh, slide of question or if you want uh, to uh, ask question personally please do feel free to use uh, to uh, to to use your microphone so maybe one more from me I've got plenty of questions, always plenty of questions. <laughs> uh, so maybe um, your, your practical from, from I mean, um, what do you do on a daily basis? Maybe one small practice you do on a daily basis to make this world more sustainable. In Sweden, well, you do a lot, yeah? <laughs> yes. Well, right now I do work uh, in an IT industry. Uh, and tech. And in my work, actually, we are helping organizations. I'm a consultant, so I'm helping organizations uh, with better strategic decisions uh, through different platforms. But that means that we are putting here a focus on connect your strategy uh, to your initiatives and executing right way. Make the right investments prioritize them correctly. So this is what I do. But then, of course, I get a lot of opportunities like right now for speaking. I'm a volunteer at a PMI Sweden chapter. So that gives me a lot of opportunities to contribute as well, giving back. 
Yes. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one more about how can you encourage? Because in Sweden, probably because it's a mindset, kind of mindset, and Sweden is much easier. But in other countries, it's it's always the easiest way. We choose the easiest way. It's not the, the, the best way. So how can we encourage project managers and sponsors, decision makers uh, to, uh, to put more effort, to build this awareness, uh, to make our project more sustainable? Mm -hmm. I think there are two aspects there. One, where is the demand coming from? Is it from the customer? Is the customer want something that is cheaper but not so good qualities? Does the customer doesn't really care if this is sustainable product or a sustainable project, but then maybe we as a project managers, we do care, but the customer doesn't care, right? Uh, so I think, again, as I mentioned, collaboration and making awareness, uh, but that awareness comes, I think, more on the government level or other social, um, uh, the non-profit sector level, where they do make a comp a campaigns that how sustainability is important. And those agents, then they increase the awareness and then of course the demand will increase for the sustainable projects. And then at the end, of course, the companies will be forced to change their ways change their strategy because they know my, my customer is not going to choose my products or the benefits of my projects because there is a competitor that is producing something more sustainable. And I think that is a mentality here, but it comes to a choice and the choice is a privilege sometimes. Hmm? Thank you. There's one more question. Can you please share some failed projects about sustainability from your practice or colleagues? Mm, the failed projects. Uh, I actually, I can uh, share, I have worked many, many years in an international development sector. And this is very interesting case, I think, uh, because international development aims to do good, right? Uh, a lot of aid, a lot of billions of money sent to developing countries and collaborations made to help the people in the poverty or humanitarian uh, help or so, so. But actually, I think a lot of projects, uh, international projects basically fail. Why? There are a lot of reasons, but I think one is that there is... Um, um, I would say there's no sustainability actually in those projects. Yes, the projects are meant to help the people, but they are not sustainable. Also in their life cycle, there is a huge demand from the sponsors who set their criteria. There is a very strict deadlines. Yes, you need to deliver. We as a sponsors, we will give you billions of money to do this project and you have to do it or you will lose. And of course, this project could be very important and could be really solving some um, basic needs of the local communities. But perhaps at a, at a mid stage, you realize that you are not really solving the problems. And again, I think it's that life cycle uh, of a waterfall project management where we plan so much at the beginning and then we just implement, but we are not going back to those stakeholders. We are not asking them, is it really still beneficial for you? You know, and uh, perhaps there was no beneficial at all, the end, the, the end product of the project. So I think it's, uh, it's it's that life cycle. I think it's a um, big factor. It's a big root cause. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's a great yes. conversation. I would go on on and on. <laughs> I like this subject a lot. Uh, anyone more questions? That's a chance to ask. We still have some time. I can see Gamze. Hello. <laughs> You're already here. Hello. 
Okay, if no questions, thank you very much, Katarina. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was really, really great presentation. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, what's the plan now? Quick break as well? <laughs> Well, you're the host, so I'm the host. Okay, <laughs> decide. <laughs> so let's uh, let's guess, make so the yeah, collaboration. I think we have ten minutes, unless unless Gamse wants to talk seventy minutes, which <laughs> I'm sure would be joyful. Otherwise, I would recommend have a quick break. Yeah, I think a quick break for people. Grab coffee, grab tea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then we will, we will join a presentation because some people might uh, come just for for or start for Gamze's presentation and might miss the beginning. So let's yes. take a break and uh, come back uh, around half past.